speak about is uh, <clears throat> something that we really have never spoken about to have a clear understanding of fundamentally what's going on in the world today and what's going on in, in human history. We seem to be in some kind of vortex, some kind of period, which is very mysterious. And one of the most mysterious qualities which I uh, feel is going on is there some, there's something about um, the current period uh, in our history, which is a very strange <clears throat> uh, occurrence. Uh, for most of human history, the knowledge of science was very limited. For example, in biology in the 1950s, in biology when I was going to school in the 50s and so on, biology was really the, uh, the study of organs and systems in the body and how the body works. You know, there was the circulatory system, the digestive system, and so on and so forth. And biology was nothing more than really a study of uh, the, the, the biological systems of different species, especially mankind. But in the 1950s, there was a tremendous revolution in biology called molecular biology when they began to study life down to the level of atoms and molecules. And this was specifically uh, with the discovery of uh, DNA uh, and so on. And what exactly is DNA? DNA is a, a molecule, a protein molecule, that contains really the, uh, the trace of every trait in a human being. Every trait the human being is height, is weight, uh, is, is intelligence, and so on and so forth, uh, is genetically encoded in this one molecule called uh, DNA. And what they were always trying to understand is how could this one molecule contain all the information that has to do with a human being? Are you talking about trillions of different possibilities of different ideas? So the question is, how can you have, how can you have this, uh, this one molecule that serves as a complete uh, template for all uh, human characteristics? The second thing they were concerned about is exactly how is this molecule given over from the parent to the child? In other words, you'd have to replicate every one of these uh, characteristics at the molecular level and hand it over to your fetus, uh, to your children. And how was that done? So it was a very deep mystery of exactly how uh, reproduction is done and so on. And what we're trying to do is determine something about the molecular structure of DNA that perhaps it would provide a clue of some sort in terms of this, thing, this measure. So by using uh, what's called X-ray crystallography, by, by bouncing x-rays off the molecule in some way, they were able to determine to a large extent the actual structure of the DNA molecule. And what they found was an amazing thing, that the DNA molecule is actually uh, what's called a double helix. You know, a helix is like a staircase, a spiral staircase going down. But it was a double helix in the sense that there were two molecules that were tied to each other as they went down. And finally, after working on this for a while, they were finally able to come up with the molecular structure of the DNA molecule. And this was a world-shaking discovery because for the first time it reduced biology from rather just a study of organisms and the various different biological systems in the body of different uh, creatures and so on, and of mankind. And they suddenly were able to begin to study the biological processes in terms of their level at the molecular level. In other words, how is circulation, the digestion, or anything else, how is that performed by the body at the atomic and the molecular level? So biology became a completely different study and for the last, what, 70 years, 80 years and so on, 
they've been increasing their knowledge about this. So now they have a very profound knowledge to a large extent of how the body works at the molecular level. Not only that, but in the science of physics, the same thing was going on. That at first, Newton allowed the idea of uh, the laws of motion and the laws of gravity, and then they were finally able to um, accelerate this information at the atomic level, and they began to discover two areas of physical laws, what's called the macroscopic level, which is the laws of physics at the uh, universal level, how planetary and stellar bodies behave and so on, and all the laws fundamentally of physics uh, at the, uh, the life level uh, of people. Now that's called macroscopic physics or the physics of the large unit of the large. But they were also able to discover many of the laws of how the uh, nucleus and the atomic structure of a, of a matter was and they were able to discover tremendous amounts about the laws of atomic physics and nuclear physics and particle physics. So in the last hundred years, you've had an explosion of information in the area of physics and so on and chemistry. So between these sciences they were able to explore, mankind was able to puncture a certain uh, gap in the laws of nature and truly begin to understand exactly to some, you know, to a large extent, how the universe functions. And coupled with the progress in engineering, which is applied physics in a certain way, which allows you to use this information, all this uh, huge information that they were discovering in terms of actually technology. So that's why mankind has uh, emerged very rapidly from basically very little information about how the universe works at the uh, uh, physical level, at the atomic level, and begin to construct many devices and so on, which uh, we use in our daily life and so on. So what do we see? We see a tremendous explosion in information. You know, a tremendous explosion in information. Now the question is, okay, so that's, that's fantastic, you know, we really progressed in understanding how the world works. But the problem is, is that even though we've discovered to a large extent uh, how the world works, but the prevalence of the atheism, a disbelief in God, becomes rampant. I mean, there are whole societies, whole countries which are actually atheistic, the communist countries of China and Russia, are fundamentally based on complete atheistic concepts. Even in America, the scientists, many of the biologists, are really atheists. They believe in some way uh, all the species of living things really were produced randomly just by itself. And this presents a tremendous problem. How is it with the proliferation of information regarding, you know, how is mankind able to be an atheist? Because even, for example, when you look at science, science stipulates that the universe operates fundamentally through patterns. And these patterns are called laws. And each of these behavior patterns is a cause and effect relationship in a certain law. So science, therefore, is the uh, narrative of all these laws of the universe. The same with biology. DNA is one of the most complex molecules ever discovered. And it's not random at all. You see an incredible system of how information is carried and transferred from one person to another. So what they really have noticed is on the explosion of science in all its categories for the last, what, the last 150 years is really an explosion in the recognition that human, that, that universal events, a scientific events, occur in a specific pattern called the law. In other words, there's a tremendous regularity in the way the world works. 
So what we see all over, what science recognizes, is the concept of regularity. Because the law not only works once, it works every time. You know, if you have the cause, you have the effect. So the fact that they're able to look at, for example, uh, living species, they estimate that there are millions and millions of species, like in the insect population. Maybe there's something like two million species of insects. And so, and birds, and mammals, and, 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 and fish. I mean, there's a tremendous number of different species. And yet they believe somehow that each of these different species occurred randomly. But that's impossible. They can't even explain how one species of mankind itself occurs randomly. Because most random events, like mutations, let's say, are negative and destructive. Very few of them result in a positive thing. And even that, you know, an event that occurs to a human being, for example, which uh, aids him in his survival, you know, maybe a small thing like suddenly he grows a little taller and so on. But it cannot result in a new organ. New organs cannot come from random events because many times the organ itself is extremely complex. So for each complex behavior pattern put together to produce a certain organ is impossible, like the human, the eye. The eye cannot be produced uh, randomly and so on. And that's just many examples. That's that's millions and millions. For example, the human brain, the ability to think is the the coexistence of uh, a, a trillion different nerve cells uh, interrelating with each other in terms of new, new, so it's called neural synapses, where each nerve cell is bound to another nerve cell to what's called a synapse. But this is impossible to do in a random thing. You can't even be able to get one. The probability of this, of a human being suddenly coming out from an evolutionary process randomly is absolutely impossible. Yet, one of the discoverers of the uh, structure of a DNA molecule, Francis Crick. Uh, James Watson and Francis Crick were the two biologists that discovered this. And Francis Crick, at least as uh, known as definitely, was an atheist. So the question is, how could he be an atheist? He's looking at something which is extremely complex and impossible to be manifest uh, by a random event. It's like someone once said, for me to believe in evolution, that evolution created all the different species of living things is like a, a tornado going to a junkyard and out the a consequence of that, the outgrowth of that, is a Boeing 747. That's impossible. Yet many biologists, maybe I don't even know if the majority, are atheists. They believe that even though they're looking at law and order, total regularity, all this regularity is random, has no origin. So therefore, the question is, what is going on here? What does this mean? First of all, there are two questions. First of all, what does this mean? You know, and and number two, uh, how could people maintain this concept of atheism in the face of this profound explosion of regularity? How is that possible? I used to wonder that for many years. I was wondering, how is it possible for people to be an atheist? And so many people are atheistic. I mean, before in the 18th century, the 17th century, you could rarely find an atheist. You know, all people, for all the humans, we basically believed in God. Even though they believed in God of multiplicity, they would believe there were many gods or to be some degree was more in a human shape, you know, where gods were like avatars, where there were human beings that had divine powers, okay. But they still believe in the concept of a designer being responsible for the design. But the question is, wow, how could that be? That's the real question. So when you think about it, that can only result in what? What could be the answer to that question? 
So the only answer to the question that I can see, see is, is that it's specifically the combination of of uh, two uh, two events. First of all, the souls of all the people in the world must be very small. So in other words, the ability to see the MS or to acknowledge the MS is very minute. You know, the amount of hastogus or spiritual insight that a person is capable of having depends on the magnitude of a soul, of a neshama. And when that neshama is very great, because let's say it comes from a very high world, so his ability to encompass MS is very great. But if it's very small, in other words, it's barely functional as a neshama, that means his ability to look at certain, to look at regularity and see a designer is much lower. So obviously the souls of mankind must be very, very low to account for this concept of atheism and so on. And that makes sense. Because fundamentally, what did I say about this time? This time is the period when God is trying to save the lowest souls in all of history. In other words, the lowest souls of all of history, all of mankind, Jews and Goyim, whoever they are, had been collected and brought back in one time in the 20th, in, in, in the 20th, in our century, and so on and so forth. And these are the lowest souls of all. In terms of Kali Sarol, many of these neshamas, these souls, are really Muslim. You know, Jews who betrayed other Jews. And what God wants to do is fundamentally try and save as many of these Jews as he can. So he brings them back in a period where fundamentally many of them are irreligious. Like the Jews themselves are 93% irreligious. And why is it that they are irreligious? That's to make them unaccountable. Because the only way to take away uh, this, this accusations against Jews is by fundamentally making them unaccountable, even though they are responsible, but they're fundamentally unaccountable. In order to do that, he brings back the, these souls, which are the lowest souls of all, and they are never given any Torah education. So they really don't know really what they're missing, or they don't know what they're losing. But at the same time, they cannot be accused of the sins that they do, because they're unaccountable to lack of ignorance. And it's called a door, Shakur Chayav, a door which is completely liable, and a door that's a, din, a teenage in Israel, that they are children who are captured by the Goyim and have no Torah education whatsoever. So the fundamental purpose of this last generation is to save all these souls that fundamentally should not be saved. Now, there are, of course, certain exceptions to this, but fundamentally, this is generally the principle. But what explains the concept of science breaking out? What does that mean when the Torah says that in the last years of human civilization there will be a tremendous explosion of chokmah, of wisdom? What is that referring to? And the answer is if you look at it very carefully, what's going on seems to be fundamentally really very obvious. In other words, when you see such an outbreak of science on such a level, what level is that like? Well, that looks like that's the 50th level. Because what is the 50th level? What is the nun? The 50th level is the sudden awareness of MS. But MS to a certain degree, which is true MS, where suddenly you understand things that were incomprehensible before. And as regards the physical universe, they have a new level of MS that they've never possessed in all of human history. Today, your average scientist knows more about the universe the macro universe and the micro universe, the atomic scale, than he has ever known before. So in a certain way, God has allowed the explosion of the 50th gate, the Nun Charabina. But that information is only really known in the physical universe. Mankind has been able to reach the 50th gate and is continuously moving in the 50th gate in terms of what's called mycebraceous. My refers to that category of knowledge and information and laws 
which characterize the physical universe, how the physical universe comes from the spirit universe in a certain sense, but it's the underpinnings of the physical universe. And God has allowed this level of information to become extant for the human being. So, therefore, when you look at two things, you see, you see a fundamental event. You see the existence of the 50th gate in terms of the physical universe. Yes. But at the same time, you see that the magnitude of the souls in the, in the current uh, 20th century and so on is very small, extremely small. So the combination of a very small neshama or very little spirituality and the combination of uh, a tremendous explosion of wisdom, of chokhmah, of, of science, is a combination which can tolerate atheism. That's right. Because the smaller the soul, the more he will understand the 50th gate. Now, this is a very strange view. We've never, we've never truly understood this. But I want to explain that this is a fundamental principle that seems to be the current uh, principle of the Ashtocha. It was said that in Mitzrayim, the Jewish people, when they were in Egypt, were enslaved and so on. And they went down to the 49th degree of Tumor, of Zohar. But God took them out before they could reach the 50th. What does that mean? It means that the Jews were at the 49th level of Tumor, of the sins, because the Jews worshipped the Egyptian pantheon of gods. And if God had let them remain into Egypt, they would have gone down to the 50th. So what would have happened then? Well, it says if, if that would have been, the, they would have gone to the 50th level, that's the level of the Nun Sharebina. And it says at that level, they would have to be annihilated. Why? Because think of it. The question is this. When a person has an option to do either two things, either to believe God as he is, where the relationship is a me in a me, or to believe in God as an alternative outside, me and you. At the 50th level, you see clearly who God is. That's right. The 50th level is a presentation of information which is so profound, you clearly see who God is. You do. And that's what it means in the Pasuk, at the 50th gate, at that level of wisdom, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God like the waters cover the sea. Because the knowledge of God will be completely visible thoroughly because of the intellectual grasp of the ultimate truths. So why is it that if the Jews had reached the 50th gate in Egypt, they would have had to be annihilated? Because fundamentally, to be a Russia and to be in the 50th gate is an impossibility. In other words, you cannot be at the level of the 50th gate with that level of wisdom and insight into God and be a Russia. You cannot. Because if you're a Russia and at that level of Chokhmah, it's impossible for you to do tshuva. It's impossible, for, it's impossible for you to be redeemed. So this would have been the circumstance. So therefore, had God let the Jews go into the 50th level of, 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 of uh, Chokhmah, or the 50th level of, of uh, that level of vicious, which the Jews received at that level, would have been so profound that you're not simply looking at the Zorma. You know, it's Zorma, it's, what, what exactly is Zorma? What I said once and I say again, Zorma is actually your choice becoming an entity. Your choice to do evil or not to believe in God is, becomes an entity or a malach. And his action to you is a, as a parasite. He is now attached to you and needs you to live. But in other words, you're looking at what used to be your sin, your choice, and now it becomes a malach. So therefore, you have created a new relationship that exists between you and your sins, and so on. But all the time when you sin, when you sin, 
then you create these angels which now reflect your choices. But at the 50th gate, your sin is not a choice that simply becomes a malach. Your choice remains your choice. In other words, at the 50th level, with the expression of so much wisdom, it's such that if you are still a Russia where you believe that God is outside of you and so on, it's such that it becomes you. You actually become your sin because your sin becomes your choice. It can no longer be converted into an entity outside of you, which is an, as a predator, a predator type of relationship with you. It actually becomes you. In other words, the 50th gate is not possible to produce a clipper. The concept of tumor, the concept of a clipper, the concept of what's called the malachi achavola is only possible at the first 49 gates. Because in those cases, there's still the possibility of making a mistake. And God saves you from the Midita Din, from the attribute of justice, by allowing, the, allowing these mistakes to possibly be redeemed. You can still do tshuva. But if you're still maintaining these sins and this perception of God in a completely wrong way, where you're thinking that, that He's outside of you, even though, and not the design of the universe that there were other powers besides him, then that level of vicious cannot be manifest as an outside entity called the Malachi Achavola. That must remain as your choice. So therefore, you cannot be redeemed forever. So therefore, you must be annihilated by the Mizadin. So what we see from this, that the free will is only possible in the first 49 levels, not on the 50th, which is the exposure of the ultimate truth, which indicates the existence of God. At the 50th level, what happens? That's what it is. At the 50th level, you are your choice. So that's why it was said that the Jews, had, had they reached the 50th level and so on. But the interesting question is this. We see that because of most of mankind, in a certain sense, is someone at that 50th level. If we say that the exposure to, to such tremendous scientific information is a certain level of the 50th gate, which it is, and so on, we still see that mankind can still function. He can still function, he can still sin, and in a certain way, get away with it, because he's unlike unaccountable. So therefore, what we see is an extension that in order to pervert a, a Jew, you see, to exist in the 50th level and still keep his Yetzirah, still have a choice. God had to change the system where it's possible to have free will even at the 50th level. And this is a nace. But how was this accomplished? So when God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, I will forgive them and so on, in other words, he seemed to be saying that somehow I will change the laws, the dynamics of mercy. And this is what we have to explore. When did this happen? When did it happen that you can actually allow a person's free will to do a sin and therefore also to be rehabilitated from the sin? Because you can create what's called Zom or you can make his choices into actual entities, you know, which interact with him and so on and so forth. You can allow him to do tshuva. We see that this is normally impossible at the 50th level. But yet we see that's what's happening now. Mankind is able to be atheist, confirmed atheist, even though they are looking at incredible, the incredible design capabilities of the Rabbani Shalom. So therefore, what's going on in our times would be absolutely impossible. So the question that we're asking is, when did this start? Because this seems to be a fundamental change in the human condition, because the human condition of free will cannot exist at the 50th level. With such clear insight to who God is, you cannot be given the free will to do a sin. And if you do a sin, it's because that sin becomes you. So when did this happen? Since this seems to be the principle of what God is doing now, 
to save as many as he can, even people who are Muslim, even people who have no chalik in Eilam Abba. We see that the 20th century is a complete exception to the possibility of free will. So that's what I want to explore. When did this happen? At what point in human history and so on and so forth? <clears throat> and then why did it happen? And that's really what I'm saying. So all my information that I presented now is some kind of an explanation, the true explanation to understand what is going on currently is really a question of at what level are the Jews today uh, uh, in terms of their free will? Are they the, the 49th level, which is still possible, or they actually have emerged into the 50th level where free will is impossible because you cannot be redeemed from this. Well, not because there is no Zorma. I mean, not because you can, it's very hard to get out of that. You know what I'm saying is a fundamental principle. At the 50th level of light where God reveals his truth, you, you can do a sin at that level, but that sin cannot be uh, transformed into Zorma. Because this is what you have to understand. Zorma means that your sin, which is your choice, is transformed into an entity, it refers to the entification of your sin. And now your sin is an entity. And because your sin is an entity, it's therefore possible to remove that entity. That's right. That malach which represents your sin can be removed by doing tshuva because it depends on you, on your consent to enable them to exist. And if you suddenly do tshuva, you withdraw your consent. That's why it's possible to do tshuva even toward the end of your life. Even if you've held on to that sin for 50 years, it doesn't make a difference. Then gradually that sin will disappear because the ability of the malach hachabol of an angel of destruction to coexist with you as a separate entity exists at that point. And therefore, since the tshuva is the removal of the entity, you can do, you can do a, a tshuva. But what we see is this, is that if your choice is no longer possible to become Zorma, in other words, it cannot be transformed into an entity called a Malach HaChavola, and therefore, that Malach does not represent your sin anymore, then that means that that sin has become your choice. So the application of din applies to you, and you are annihilated. So fundamentally, what this means when I say that the 50th gate is not an arena of free will, it's not an arena where you can choose between good and bad. It's an arena beyond free will. Why? Because no aspect of the Midas Arachman, the attribute of mercy, can be manifest. Because in order to manifest mercy, you have to be able to convert the sin, which is your choice, into an entity, and then it finally has to be removed. But that can be only be done at, at what? At the 49th level and below. It cannot be done at the 50th level. So since your sins cannot be converted into Zorma, into these angels, this angelic universe called the Malachi Achavola, your sin cannot be forgiven or removed because there's nothing outside of you which is attached or represented by it. It is represented by you, your choice. So the Midas Harachim does not work beyond the 49th level. And that's what it means that when the Jews, if the Jews had gone down to 50th level by, in Egypt, they would never have been able to crawl out of that. So now we have a deeper understanding of what that is. But the question is, well, it seems to be that in Egypt, if you go to the 50th level, you are outside of the activity, the mechanism of mercy. That's what it means. But we see that in the 20th century, you are inside the mechanism of mercy, even though to some extent you've gone into the 50th level. So the real question now is, what happened? What does this mean? You know, it, it seems to be something in a major way has shifted from between, the, from between the parameters 
of this generation and all of human history. So therefore, what I'd like to do is to go back in time, you know, and what I'd like to go back in time is to when, it's when the Jews were in Egypt, because that's when the Jews were formed. When the 12 tribes, the sons of Yaakov Avinu went into Egypt, because Joseph was the prime minister, that's when the Jews met the Egyptians. Now, okay, good. And the Jews are only capable and be, uh, they were tested by the Egyptians who were Bali Avadazara, who believed in the worship of God. And what does that mean? What in essence is Avadazara? Well, what Avadazara is, is a distortion in the concept of divinity. Because even though the Egyptians believed in God as a primary source of energy and achievement, you know, who's capable of divine energy, but the incredible thing about the Egyptians is that they believed that was not one, there were many gods. So even though their chief god was Amun-Ra, the sun god, he was the most powerful god of all. But this, is not, this, this did not exclude other gods. There were what's called major gods and then what's called minor gods. And this concept of multiplicity is the fundamental definition of Abba Zohar. When it says, about the Vanisharam, it means that he is the only one that exists. There is no other God but him. There is no other divine presence but his. To admit the possibility that there can be a, a duality, that there can be two gods, is instantly a transgression of Avodah Zohar. And that's what you say all the time. There is one God. And that's the essence of Avodah Zohar. Because as soon as you believe in two gods, you believe that that power can be shared. And that's impossible. Only one being can have such a power which encompasses everything. So therefore, they believed that if they worshipped the planets and the stars, which called Mazolus, that these were manifestations of those gods. So for example, the planet Mars symbolized the god of war. So in a certain sense, Mars, which is actually a Greek god or Roman god, was the god who had the power of war and so on. And Jupiter was the power of the sun. So there were major and minor gods in all the ancient religions because all of those religions believed in the concept of duality as applies to God. Because as long as you see God as outside of you, so therefore you have a me, you relationship with him, that's considered Abba the Zohar. And it doesn't make a difference if that other power is a human or is a divine being or semi-human. It doesn't make a difference what it is. Anything which is attributed to have a certain power over you, plus the fact that you have a certain power over it, that's immediately, that's a Vodazara. So therefore, Egypt obviously was a country with a Vodazara. And the Jews went into Egypt to restore the Shrina to the world. The Shrina was removed from the world by other Mauritian and the sin of other Mauritian. And where did the Shrina go? The Shrina became the fundamental source which allows your sins to become Zohar. And this is the mystery of the Shrina. The Shrina, in a certain sense, represents the presence of God or a certain divine energy. And that divine energy is the fundamental basis how your choices become entities or angels. That's right. And that's what it means when we say the Shrina is in Golas. What does that mean? It was a Golas. It's an exile. The exile of the Shrina means when the divine energy, which exists from God, it suddenly becomes the foundation of what? Of the Zorma. And it, that's what allows your sin to be transformed into a Malach. And when that happens, the sin becomes an entity itself, and therefore you are capable of doing tshuva. But in order for this system to exist, Zorma, which is the identification of your sin, has to exist. And therefore it needs a certain energy in order for your sin, which is a choice, 
and it's allowed to become an actual entity, it needs a certain energy of transformation. And that energy of transformation is derived from the Shekhinah. That's right. So as soon as you sin, for the attribute of mercy to allow you to exist, means that the attribute of mercy is allowed to suddenly become, to exist, and become what? An energy, so that it converts your sin into uh, an actual predator. And the one that does that is the Shekhinah. That's why the immediate consequence of sinning is always putting the Shin in Golas. Why? It's not because the Shin is punished. No, it's not. It, it, it has to absent itself from its own power in a certain sense and lend its power to your choice, to the sin that you make, so that eventually it becomes a Malach, it said. Now, I can't, I'm not going to go into the dynamic of that. It's very deep. But that's what happens. So therefore, Egypt, where did Egypt get its knowledge of our desire? So this is critical. Why did the Jews have to go into Egypt before they got the Torah and so on? What is going on? In other words, what I'm saying, this is not simply an event. It's not an event in biblical history. It's not a historic event. It is the main event of Klal Yisrael itself. Klal Yisrael was created as people who have a guarantee to go to Ilum Haba. But what is the main task of Klal Yisrael? It's to destroy that notion that the energy of God is absolutely one and does not tolerate another failure. So therefore, the essence of Klal Yisrael is the belief in the unity of God. But the essence of our Zohar idol worship believes in the duality of God. So there you have it. The Jewish people have to represent the idea of the unity of God, the impossibility of another God. And that's what the Jewish people represent. Egypt represents the opposite idea of our Zohar. That what? That God can be a duality in terms of primary and secondary gods and so on. So therefore, you have the central concept between Israel and Egypt. And that concept is the most important mission of Qal Yisrael. <clears throat> but the question is this, what was so special about Egypt? All the countries in the world at that time, all the countries in the world at that time were in the Avada Zohar. They all believed in the multiplicity, in the duality of God. So why would the Jews have to go into Egypt? In other words, that confrontation would exist between them and any other nation. No. Because the Gemara, the, the, the Medrash and the Gemara tells us something special about Egypt. It says, when God handed, when God handed the information about magic, about spiritual magic, and so on, and the dark forces 90% of that information, spiritual information, was handed to Egypt. That's right. 90% of the information about the spiritual universe, about the ability of the universe to produce a godlike entity, was given over to Egypt. Egypt was the most spiritual nation on earth. There was no nation equivalent to it. And how do we see this to be true? Well, it's really obvious. Although, uh, archaeologists and historians keep on denying it. Because when you look at the Egyptians, what the Egyptians did was unlike any other nation on earth or since. Because even though there were nations which constructed great uh, architectural figures, uh, uh, buildings, there was no nation like Egypt. The construction of the pyramid was absolutely astounding. Nobody knows how they did it. Nobody knows how it's possible because they didn't even have the wheel. So they couldn't even transport all the stones and the building blocks to build the temple. Well, the Temple of Giza, you know, was built in, uh, they say, estimate 2700 BCE. And it was built without a wheel. But the stones from the Egyptian temple, the Egyptian uh, Giza, was brought from many miles away, from a quarry many miles away. And each stone had at least, uh, each stone was at least 
two tons, 4,000 pounds, you know? Well, how could you build something with some stones, 4,000 pounds each? And not only that, you know, how many uh, buildings, how many stones there were in the Egyptian pyramids? Over, over, over a million to two million. That's right. The Egyptian pyramid of Giza has over two, has about two millions of these blocks. So the question is, well, how could they schlep this? How could they bring these stones to this place to build it? Nobody knows. Nobody even can understand it. Not only that, they don't even know really what the tomb of the uh, the pyramid of Gita was for. You know, a lot of the archaeologists want to say that these uh, pyramids were really burial places of the pharaoh. That may be true in certain cases, but fundamentally, they have never discovered any pharaonic body. No king lies in the pyramid of Giza. They don't know why. It seemed to be it was not a burial chamber. So what was its purpose? Nobody really knows. But in some way, the ability to build it and the ability to construct such a vast thing, it was the tallest building on earth for thousands of years. And the Egyptians had, were impo had impossible knowledge to build it. And they couldn't build it. They didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the knowledge. And I don't care if you have 50,000 or 100,000 workers working for 20 years. You cannot build that structure. Not only that, there's about, uh, I think, hundreds and hundreds of pyramids that were built. So how is it possible for them to build? I think they say there was almost a thousand. I don't remember. But how could the Egyptians have built all these pyramids and so on in the same way? Nobody knows. But I say it's obvious because this is obvious. What they did have was the Chochmah of Kishuv, the Chochmah of Abu Zohar. They knew the spiritual concepts of my sabracious to a certain extent. You know, they were able to do its own. And they were not small people. What does that mean, they were not small people? Well, clearly the Medrash says that when the Jews were at Yamsuf, and they were going through Yamsuf to get away from the Egyptians, that the Egyptian magicians, they were magicians. Uh, it even gives the name, Yamus and Yambus. They were so great in their knowledge of tissue, black magic, and so on, and the, the possible use of magical forces, and so on, that they were actually able to combat the Malachim. There was actually a war going on between the war of Gavriel and Mikhail, and so on and so forth, and the Egyptian magicians. And in certain cases, the Egyptian magicians were winning. They were actually able to confront actual angels. Now, where can they get such knowledge? How did they get such knowledge? That their knowledge of spiritual forces was not simply theoretical, it was practical. So this tells you something incredible, something really credible, which uh, I don't think anyone has noticed. And what is that? That is that the Egyptians were not only masters of Kishuv and Avodah Zohar. No. But they had such a knowledge that in a certain sense, where did that knowledge come from? Well, we don't really know. But you know something we do know? We know that when you have that level of knowledge where you can construct pyramids and you construct such an empire and they were the most powerful nation on earth, we do know that that knowledge is such a level of information in the spiritual world that on a certain level, it actually is equivalent to the 50th gate. That's right. When you have that knowledge of Kishuv and of Adizora, and you can formulate to actually do things in such a way, that's actually equivalent to the 50th gate. Or at least that's the beginning of the 50th gate. But this is the 50th gate, not in physical science. This is the 50th gate in Ruchnius. So therefore, the Egyptians were the masses of Ruchnius. They achieved the knowledge of Ruchnius and the laws of Ruchnius and so on, which is unheralded and unrepeated by any other nation on earth. And who was the person who had this information? Well, the Torah does mention the person. The person's name was Mitzrayim, right? Egypt. 
the word Egypt comes from the word, you know, it, 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 it comes from the word which is somewhat today in Hebrew called Mitzrayim. His name was Mitzrayim. And it says that Mitzrayim was the main architect of the Tower of Bovel, Middle Bovel, which was one of the main weapons that was used by the people at the time of the Doha Flogger, the generation of dispersion. Who is that people? Well, it says that the first 20 generations after Adam Rishon is called the Doha Mabo because in the end they ended that. They were very high spiritual people, much bigger than the people today. And they fundamentally had access to spiritual forces. The next 10 generations after the Mabo was called the Doha Flogger. They were people who were very powerful in spiritual forms. And they were the first to form these 70 categories of, the, uh, of these people. But at the end of the, 70, in the, in the, in the, at the, end of the, the Doha Flogger, they discovered a method of the ultimate form of a Vodazoa. They were finally able to understand the Mysobratius of how they thought, they thought they can defeat God. So when they built this power called the Power of Babel, this was an attempt to dethrone God, to install God as a you, as a permanent you. That's right. That's how they deserve. But we don't realize that. And the Torah doesn't say much about them. But it's clear what they were doing. Because they were fundamentally peaceful among themselves, but their intent was to dethrone the absolute power of God by consigning God to becoming a you, having an outside. And they had some kind of knowledge. And this knowledge, although it doesn't say this, was given to them by this person called Mitzrayim. So that's where Egypt got this knowledge. Where did it get the knowledge from? It got its knowledge as some kind of Mesora, a tradition from this person called Mitzrayim. And the whole nation, therefore, was called Mitzrayim. And what kind of nation was this? This was the greatest nation on earth because they had the greatest information about spirituality that was given to mankind up to that point. So it would seem that what they had was the 50th gate of spiritual knowledge, at least the beginning of it. So therefore the Jews were told to go into the nation of Mitzrayim who had the beginning of the 50th gate of spiritual knowledge and show them that this is not true. That even though you have the, the, the somewhat the 50th gate of knowledge, but God is not a you. He doesn't, he's above that. He is not a you. He includes everything. So therefore, this contest between the Jew and the, the, the relationship that Abraham Avinu had with God and what the Egyptians believed was God was in contradiction. So in other words, if you look at it as a natural enemy, that the natural enemy of the Jew, or really the natural enemy, are the ones who believed, you know, in terms of the Avodah Zorah, which is the natural enemy of the, of, of the belief of Avram, was what signified Avram Avinu, was the absolute belief in the unity of God. Hashem Echad, so that he would even sacrifice his own son for that, the Akedi Sitzrok. Against what? Against their enemy, which is an absolute belief in the duality of God, which is represented by Egypt. So mankind at the entry of the Jews into Egypt finally came to a level where the basic confrontation between two different views, God as a unity or God as a duality, came into conflict. And it was the purpose of the Jews to, uh, to resist this conflict, that God is not what a duality, God is a unity. And they would indicate that by not worshipping the gods of Egypt. But they fell. And because they fell and they worshipped the gods of Egypt, they were impressed with the Egyptian power. What kind of power was that? Well, obviously this was very powerful. Because even though the Jews were descended from Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and from the Shvatim, and learned the concept of the unity of God from the others, <coughs> After the tribes died, <clears throat> they still became influenced. But how were they influenced? How could you be influenced when you were that kind of patriarch, patriarchal system? Well, the answer they did. Some reason we don't really understand how. 
they somehow realized they didn't worship the Egyptian gods. Because why? Because the Egyptians did it. That's not what it is. Because they worship the Egyptian gods because on a certain level, they saw a truth in what the Egyptians were doing. They realized that the Egyptians had tremendous knowledge of magic and spirituality that nobody in the world had ever achieved, really. So in a certain sense, they saw the 50th gate of spirituality in the Egyptian culture. So that's the Egyptians were able to impress the Jews of the Abad Zohar because it was really impressive. The Jews would wonder, how could they know so much? So therefore, they must have something substantial. And that's the honest truth about what was going on. And they became uh, vulnerable to this, and they became victimized. They worshipped the gods of Egypt like certain ways, like the Egyptians. And therefore, they went down to the 49th level of Tumor. So we see one thing clearly. We now understand something which is fundamentally somewhat different that the conflict between the Jews and the Egyptians was not simply peripheral, it was central to the tachlis, to the purpose of mankind in the world. That the Jewish belief in the unity of God, the absolute unity of God, and the Egyptian belief in the absolute duality of God, confronted that confrontation was suddenly perfect. So therefore the two greatest nations on the world, which is Egypt, and which is what Egypt confronted each other at the, uh, at, the, at the apex of history. So that's why the Jews had to go into the land of Egypt. But the Jews were not on the 50th gate, even though the Egyptians were. So the Egyptians had reached the 50th gate of Tumor. So it's a serious question if the Egyptians can ever get back. So when the Jews were able to recant by what? By suddenly sacrificing this Korban Pesach, that sacrifice was monumental. We think that it was simply a sacrifice to the Jews, but no. The sacrifice of the Korban Pesach was the decoration of the Jews. They are wrong. Egypt is not the, the, the greatest spiritual power in the universe. It's not. God is an absolute unity and not a duality. So the call and place that was the, uh, the repentance of the Jewish people, that the absolute God was God himself, the God, the God of unity. And that's what the call and place that representative is a complete rejection of the principle of the Egyptian theology that no God was a duality. So in doing that, they became worthy of going to Mount Sinai and receiving the Torah. Now, what kind of Torah was they given? That was the Torah of what? That was the Torah of the 50th gate. What many people don't know, it's not the Torah that we have. The Torah that we have was the second Torah given after the Jews worshipped the golden calf. And that was given on, on Yom Kippur. And that's called the Torah in the, in the version of Chochmah. But the Torah that was supposed to be given to the Jewish people was a Torah in the version of Keser. That was the Torah in the 50th gate. So what happened? So the Egyptians had three wars with the Jews. That's right. Why the Egyptians? Because that was fundamentally with a concept between Jew and Goy, or I should say the concept between Jew and Benoyach, because the Egyptians were Benoyach, just like the Jews were. And the fundamental concept was that we believe in God as an absolute unity, Hashem Echad, or duality. Hashem Acher. So either it's one or it's the other. Hashem Acher means God is an outside. God is an other. God tolerates the possibility of other, a duality. The Jews said, no, that's not true. God is the God of unity. Hashem Echod. And this was the fundamental concept in the sin of Adam Arishan and the sin of the Zolosoi that mankind must, to his own cause, choose the concept of Hashem Echod and reject the concept of Hashem Acher. So they rejected it once. They fell into it. They became subject to them. They became vulnerable to the Egyptian principle of Hashem Acher 
that God is another God. But then they did Shuvah with the Korban Pesach. But when they did Shuvah with the Korban Pesach, there was Zorchot to Korban Sinai. And yet what? Well, they were supposed to get the Torah of the 50th gate. And from then on, they would start. In other words, we really don't know what the Jews were supposed to do if they had not worshipped the golden calf. So the Egyptians had the first war with Egypt, uh, with the Jews, to hold them as slaves. And the Jews broke out of that in the Sea of Mitzrayim, the exit of Egypt. And then the Egyptians said, okay, now, now that the Jews are gone, we're going to get them back. We're going to go after them at Yamsuf and take them back. And then the Egyptians lost again because they weren't able to destroy them. And the Jews walked through a sea of Yamsuf and won that second war. But the third war, the war between the Egyptians and the Jews on our Sinai, they lost. Because who was that? Well, we know that there were many Egyptians who left Egypt, with, they went with the Jews because they suddenly saw that the Jews were right. Their version of God was the correct version and the Egyptian of, version of God was incorrect. So therefore, they went with the Jews to Har Sinai to receive the Torah in the form of the 50th gate. Yes. And what happened? Well, in some way, without going to too much details, they thought that Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to come down from the mountain, but they thought that that day was, what, the 40th day. Meanwhile, it was only the 39th. And I don't want to go into the whole thing, but the Sunday they were seduced, and they believed what the Arab Rav told them, the mixed multitude, who were really Egyptians. You have to understand the Arab Rav were Egyptians. They were not Jewish, even though they were the Bnei Noach. And even though they said, we see that the Jews are right, fundamentally they still harbored in their heart the desire to believe in God as a duality. And they got their opportunity, and suddenly at the 40th, the 39th day of when Moshe was gone. So they told the Jews that Moshe is dead. And I don't want to go into the mechanics of the whole thing and so on. And they constructed a new God. You see, but what most people don't know, this new God was not really a true manifestation of the Zohar. You see, there's something that you have to realize. When the Jews went to Harsinai and they were received the Torah at Harsinai, that forever changed the concept of Zohama. Because it means that the world surpassed the concept of believing in Avodah the Zohar. They changed the face. The Jews changed the face of Avodah the Zohar. So even though the Egyptians wanted to create an idol called the Egel Azov, the golden calf, it was not a true Avodah the Zohar. Because the original Avodah the Zohar was based on planets, on Mazolus. That's why uh, Akum, a Bale Avodah the Zohar called Avodah Kerchav Mazolus, the worshippers of stars and planets. But the Jews forced the Egyptians to change their own Avodah Zohar from representing the planets to suddenly representing Jewish values. And that's suddenly what happened was, when I can't go into this now, but that suddenly was the birth of the liberal progressive religions, that you can be a tzaddik without worshipping God. You can be a tzaddik by being good to other people, by doing mitzvahs, and by doing good. And you didn't have to worship the planets, but that still would be a form of Avodah Zohar because you would be in control. So Avodah Zohar was changed from the worship of planets and stars to the worship to the kindness of other people. So you may say, well, what's wrong with that? The Egel Azor, which is the golden calf, was what? was represented Moshe Rabbeinu. So what the Egyptians really did is constructed a, 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 an Avodah Zohar which really transmitted the idea of Mashiach. So in other words, what the Egyptians did at this point, they could not reform or transform the original concept of Avodah Zohar, but they changed the concept itself so that the Avodah Zohar was not a planet or a star. It became a principle of ethics. They believe that you're supposed to be kind to your fellow man. That's right. Why? Because their God was the Egel Azov, which represented Moshe Rabbeinu. They didn't stand building a Buddha Zohar. That's not what they did. They didn't build something which you worship uh, in terms of uh, idols and, and planets. They didn't make idols to represent planets. 
They made an idol to represent ethical concepts, the concepts which were espoused by Mashiach and Yosef. Because the Egel Azov was the idol representation of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's right. They made Moshe Rabbeinu, or the concept of Mashiach, as the symbol of idolatry. That's right. That's why it's not a true form of idolatry. And why was that? Because once the Jews reached the highest level of the Nun Sharebina, that alone, the presence of that alone, changed the face of Avodah Zohar forever. So therefore, Avodah Zohar can worship ethics, but they're still with Shoyim. Like as Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of England, once said, to about socialists and communists who preach ethics, and kindness, but she says, even you eventually run out of other people's money. So in other words, communists and socialists and all these isms are really Rishoyim. It's a form of the Zohar. Well, now the belief in the Mashiach, the belief in ethics, is itself the Avodah Zohar. No longer is the Avodah Zohar a planet or a star, which is the outside of God. But now it's the ability of mankind to be, uh, to be ethical and to be kind to his fellow man. But that kindness is only generated as a source of power. They use that power to say, why do I have to keep the laws between man and God? The fact that I'm kind to my fellow man, that should be enough. I am a tzaddik already. I am a tzaddik ben Adam Chaveroi, between man and man. So why do I have to keep my relationship with between man and God? So it was a new way to dismiss God and to leave God alone. And so on. But the flaw in this was simply, in order to do that, to seek that power, you had to not only do ethics, but you had to do ethics by robbing man of his money, by taking, by theft. Fundamentally, what they were doing is they, was, they were committing theft on a high scale and developing governments where governments can take the people's money and, and give gifts to the people so that they remain in power. So it's completely corrupted, and I'll have to talk about this at another time. But that's fundamentally what they were doing. So therefore, the nature of true nature of the Zohar changed permanently at Mat and Torah. Because the world reached a certain level where it was allowed for the Nun, the 50th gate, to go down to the planet Earth in the form of the Lucas Rishonis, the first tablets. And that fundamentally changed the ability of the world to worship idols. And so on. Even though it was a form of idol worship, but it never had the same power. So what do we see? We see that they won the third war. The Egyptians won the third war because now they changed their of the Zohar. But they still caused the Jews to reject the idea of the absolute unity of God. They won. They didn't win totally because the idea of idol worship itself changed. But they won in the sense they still corrupted the relationship of the Jewish people to God himself. So that it does not represent Hashem Achod, one God, but it represents Hashem Acher, other gods. So therefore, suddenly Moshe Rabbeinu was in the conflict, in the fundamental conflict where it is. How do you save the Jews? because they finally allowed the Egyptians to make them vulnerable. Even though it wasn't fully Avodah Zohar, it was a golden calf, which represented ethical principles, because the Mashiach was now the Avodah Zohar. But how could he save them? Because the ultimately the 50th gate was pure, and therefore would represent the unity of God. So Moshe Rabbeinu prayed to God, and he said a certain thing. And that's where we get the fundamental concept of the 50th gate, going into the area of free will. Moshe Rabbeinu asked God, and he said that, what, that God in some way should apply the attribute of mercy, even though the conflict between the Jews and the Egyptians occurred at the 50th level, because the Jews were about to receive the 50th gate of Torah. But Moshe Rabbeinu said, okay, look, let the 50th level itself, which contains the messianic light, the true truth of God, let that still come down in a certain way. But let that come down in a hidden form. In other words, the Jews wouldn't really lose the 50th gate. They would lose access to the 50th gate. Because now the 50th gate would be in the form of the Kabbalah, 
where God would teach that to Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu would begin to put that in the form of metaphors, Mishalom. So that was suddenly when the 50th gate itself was transmuted by Moshe Rabbeinu. Initially, the 50th gate, when the Torah was given, and it was in the form of the gate, 50th gate, should have been openly revealed as the 50th gate. And that would have solidified the end of what? The end of the human race. Because that would have been the Yomosa Mashiach. If the Jews had not worshipped the golden calf, they would have initiated the Yomosa Mashiach, the days of the Mashiach. They would have essentially reached, eventually, the level of the 50th gate totally. But since they compromised with the Egyptians and they worshipped the golden calf as the messianic representative of the Zohar, they compromised that and they lost. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, now that they compromised that, let them still survive. Let the guarantee that you gave to Abba Yitzhak and Yaakov be true. That they will be guaranteed they would win under all conditions eventually. So therefore, you find it in yourself, Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, to allow now the conflict between the Egyptians and the Jews to be in the form of the Messianic light. Let it now be in the form of the 50th gate. So the 50th gate will become the arena for their free choice. That's right. Normally, the 50th gate cannot be an arena for the Jews in terms of the sins of what they did. But now... Moshe Rabbeinu doubled the God that the 50th gate should partially be the arena of free choice. And therefore, in the arena of the 50th gate, God would allow the possibility of Zohar to be created. You know, the Shekhinah would go into the Golas of the 50th gate. That even when the Shekhinah is emitting the light of the 50th gate, that light was capable of becoming Zohar that the Shekhinah would go in the Golas of the 50th gate. That's right. As the Shekhinah was giving out the light of the 50th gate, it would still be able to go into Golas. And therefore, Malachim would be represented in the 50th gate. There would now be a new class of Malachim that would be represent the light of the 50th gate, but it would be the light of Tumor. In other words, Tumor can exist in the 50th gate in the, in the light of the Messianic light. So everything was changed. The avod of Chal Yisrael of Martin Torah was the light that should have brought the messianic period. It should have brought the messianic light. But instead, the Egyptians used that messianic light as a form of the Zohar. But that compromised the 50th gate. Because now the 50th gate could now be produced in Zoma. A class of Malachim would be created that would now represent the free will, the choices of Klal Yisrael. So therefore, even though Klal Yisrael are now sinning, they are sinning in the 50th gate. That's right. They're sinning in the 50th gate. And that was impossible before. Because in the 50th gate, you were in the light of Mashiach itself, which doesn't tolerate a Russia. But now, because the Jews had become vulnerable to the Egyptians, it would tolerate of a design, the 50th gate itself. So therefore we see that there was a tremendous change in the world. It wasn't simply that the Jews received the Torah. It's that in the world changed in terms of the Ashkocha. The Ashkocha of the world changed. Because now the, con the concept of free will, the concept of the ability to do a hate or a sin, could actually exist in the face to some extent, of the 50th gate itself. And yet, even if you are in that light for a field where you're sinning, and now you're confronted with your own sins in the guise of a malach, you can still do tshuva of it. So therefore, the entire world changed spiritually forever from the sin of the golden calf. Nobody really understands this and realizes this. Chal Yisrael went from a nation that was supposed to enter into the messianic light, they were supposed to be in that messianic light, and they're supposed to make that light the Emotion Mashiach. Now, they can still do the avoda, the avoda of either God is a unity or God is a duality in the 50th gate. In other words, the, the avoda of the Jewish people in terms of the rejection of Avodah Zohar would now take place in the 50th gate 
itself. And this was absolutely astonishing. This corresponded to the golden calf. So that means that the Avoida, the Tayag Mitras, was no longer in the form of the 50th gate. It would be in the form of Avadzora. It would be in the form of the golden calf. And you see this most. How? How do you see this? How do you see that, that I'm right? Why do I say that the Avoida of Tayasho was totally deformed? How do I see that? Because it simply says what? What was the main mitzvah that came out of what? Of the of of, of the the day de la Zov. There was one mitzvah that was suddenly created that should not have been created. What was that mitzvah that should never have existed? That mitzvah was the concept of the Mishkan, the Beis Hamikdash. Why? Because never did God have an intention to build a Beis Hamikdash, a house where He would reside on. He would never. It would never. The Shkin would never reside on a Mokum. Well, what was the Beis Hamikdash? The Beis Hamikdash was actually the heart of every Jew. For Shachandi Besoichem, and I shall dwell within them in the Bichol Leiv. I will be, but I would dwell in the heart of every Jew, and in his heart, his heart would become the new residence of the Shrina. The Shrina would not reside on a building, it would not reside in a physical sense, it will reside spiritually on his Nishama. That's where the Beis Amigdi should have been. But instead, God says, No, I'm not going to do that. Why? In other words, I will reside on a physical building. Why? Because now you have taken the Mashiach, and made him into an Avodah Zohar. It's Zeluma there. Since you have built the Mashiach in the form of an Avodah Zohar, where you worship it as a physical representation, where you make Moshe Rabbeinu a form of Avodah Zohar, so your entire Avodah, the entire Avodah of Klai would be in that form. No longer would the Shina rest in the heart of every Jew. It would now rest on what's called the Mishkan. But the Mishkan would be temporary. It could be revived and it could be restored. And gradually that was taken away from them much later on. And that's another story. So what you have to understand is something amazing happened. The entire Machlekes between Egypt and Israel was the Machlekes of the Zulosoi. Is God a unity or is God an other? Is God a duality? And that battle occurred at the 50th, at the 50th level. It, was, it occurred at the 49th level. It didn't involve the 50th level yet, but it was a battle in front of the 50th level because the Egyptians had the information of Tishuv and Ruchnius at the 50th level. And the Jews were supposed to confront that and reject that. And they did. So that's why there was Zorcha for Moshe Rabbein to go up and to receive the Torah in the form of the 50th level of light. But because the Egyptians won that war and they succeeded in making the Jews believe that what? That the Mashiach, the light of Mashiach, will become the new level of Avodah Zorah. So therefore God had to give a new mitzvah called the Mishkan. So that the Shekhinah would be, well, the Shekhinah would be uh, now represented by what? By a physical house, at least temporarily, at the outset. And therefore, our Buddha Zohar changed in the world. The world was no longer on the biblical level of the Zohar. That changed after Matan Torah. They were now on the level of Chochmah. They were now on a level of new level. With the the aspect of free will now had a new level of the Zohar. So therefore we see that the events of what happened on Mount Torah by the hate of the eagle became somewhat permanent. And God said, now you will have to come back from a point which is much lower than where you were before. Whereas before you were on the same level of Egypt. Egypt was operating from the 50th level and still maintained in Russia, and the Jews were operating on the 49th level. But now, because you allow the Egyptians to control you and to influence you to build a golden calf, and so it's you yourself have which changed the way you will worship me. Now you have descended 
to a new level, and the Vodah Zohar has descended to a new level. So now we have to work ourselves up from there, so that finally when the Mashiach comes at the end of time, we are confronted by the 50th gate. That's right. And that's the 50th gate now. What? Science. Technology. Tremendous chokhmah when it comes to understanding how the universe works. But we are doing that. We are confronting that as what a tinik shenizbo, as completely innocent, completely unaccountable. So that Kalisol, even in terms of a moisture, can be zeichet oilem haba. So in other words, we are at the end of history. Because in our century, the last century of the world, the 20th century, when mankind is about to drop into total uh, oblivion, into total uh, evil, God is saying, well, this is the last battle. Now you will battle the Erevav, especially the Erevav in all its forms, so that you do not descend into its level where it's now. So suddenly we see a connection why the Erevav has to come back in history, because they have to undo the damage. All of history is based on the war, the confrontation between the Egyptians and the Jews. One representing what? One representing uh, the concept of Hashem Echad, the unity of God, and one representing the concept of Hashem Echad at the 50th level. But now that we have descended and lost that war, the rest of human history will be about that continuous war of the Egyptians. So now the war against the Egyptians and the Jews is still here. But that's a new war called the Jews and the Erevav. The war between the Jews and the Erevav, which takes place at the end of time, like the Vindagon said, the Ika Klippa at the end of time is this Erevav. And why is that? Because they were the Erevav, they were the Egyptian empire that convinced the Jews to reject the concept of Hashem Echod. But the conflict exists on a new level. It's no longer a level of the worship of idols and stars. It's the worship of ethics. And that the Mashiach himself now is what? Is the Avodah Zohar. But nevertheless, in our generation, which is the last generation in human history in that sense, is now at war again with the Egyptians. Because it lost that third war at the time of Matan Torah. So we have to again vanquish them. And finally what? Release the 50th gate from its physical form and finally release the 50th gate so that it's no longer in the form of a muscle, it's now in the form of a nimshal. So we see a much greater connection between Martin Torah, the war between the Egyptians and the Jews, the war against what? Mitzrayim, as a fundamental war of human history. And in the form that that word takes in the 20th century is the form of an era above. And that explains the final war between mankind. Okay. I will continue this year next time. But you have to understand, I'm talking about fundamental concepts that have never really been brought out because we think we are, what we're struggling with the Torah. That's what we think. We're not. We're struggling with Egypt in a new form called Erevav. And in, in, in front of the face of the 50th gate, this war has never happened and so on. But this is the final war before the Mashiach finally comes and vanquishes that and completely restores the 50th gate in the concept of the Nimshal. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, you said at the very beginning of this year that uh, we were, because of science and technology having progressed to the point, we are at the nun now, and therefore, uh, why is it that uh, everybody, why, how is it possible that scientists and so on are, are so atheists? But right. you've said many times in the past that but if you were truly at the nun, the, the real issue that keeps them as atheists, you once asked about Albert Einstein, is that is the concept that they see tzaddik for Rallo and, and Russia Batovlo. Right. That 
it can only be answered when that that will only truly be answered and explained when truly the nun is there. So many. So in, in that sense, we're really not at no. the, the nun. You see what you know? No, you see you're missing one point. That's a good point, but there's something you're missing. You see, what is a muno? What is the amuna of a Jew today? You have to understand something is going on. Because what is Einstein said? And Einstein was right. We see God through the laws of the universe, the laws of physics, and so on and so forth. True. He said, because Einstein said, why do I see God? I see God because of regularity. In other words, it's impossible to look at the face of regularity and not see a designer. That's what it is. And God said that in the statement, God does not play dice with the world. The world is not governed by probability or statistics and so on, but only actual determinism. So therefore, Einstein believed in the God of this regularity. But if you ask Einstein, well, do you believe in a personal God, that God relates with you? Einstein says, no, I don't. Why? Because when I look at my life, when I look at the history with mankind, I, not, I don't see regularity. I see irregularity. So therefore, the question remains in front of my eyes. How can you have a God who is so regular and designing feature in terms of the universe, but when it comes to human history, it's so irregular, it's so chaotic, it's so cruel. So Einstein saw the fundamental contradiction. But the truth of the matter, if you say to yourself, what should he have believed? He should have believed what in the God of what? In the God of regularity in all cases. You see, it was a big mistake that Einstein made. It's true that when it came to the regularity of the laws of physics, you can see God. But when it came to the irregularity of the laws of human behavior, how humans treat each other, what they do, he could not see what God is doing. But God said himself, I warn you, you will not see. God warned the people that in a certain way, the fundamental principle that God exists or not exists is not based on what you see in human activity. Because God said himself, God warned mankind that even though you clearly saw him as a designer in the world of physics, you will not see him as a designer in the laws of mankind and the way he treats each other. God said, I will hide. You will not see me. You will think that this is chaos, that I am nowhere to be seen. But God warned us about that. He said that he would do it. Why? Because when God said, you will see my regularity when it comes to the attribute of justice, you know, that's what you will see. You will see me behind the laws of regularity when you see the attribute of justice. When a person does a sin and is punished, you will see justice. And a person does a mitzvah and is rewarded, you will see justice. And then you will say, well, God obeys the law of regularity, so we see. But I'm telling you that the attribute of mercy does not work by that. The attribute of mercy works only when you cannot see justice. And I cannot explain to you how that works. When Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, you know, when he said, Zu Torah, Zu Torah, how could you say that this Torah is this the word? Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, and the Malachim said to God, all the, all of, they all said the same thing. We don't see you as a God in human behavior. We see you as a God in the behavior of the universe. So God said, When it comes to human behavior in the history of mankind, it is a decree. But I am not going to reveal to you what that decree is. <clears throat> Why? Because it won't work. And I cannot explain it to you. It was if I reveal to you how I'm able to forgive mankind, how the attribute of mercy works, <coughs> as soon as that becomes knowable to you, it will be knowable to the angels of mercy. And they cannot know what I'm doing, and I cannot explain that. To explain that is to go into an area of metaphysics, and so on, which cannot be understood by man. So you will have to have a muna. In other words, you will have to believe when you look at the universe that I am the design of the universe. That you will have to believe. And it won't even be easy or, 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 difficult. It's obvious I'm a designer. You can't have two million different species, each one coming from random events. 
So it's obvious that I am the God who created the universe. I'm the God of this and, and so on of the universe in terms of its uh, ethics. But you cannot see me as the design of the universe in terms of how I treat mankind. Why? Because I am not treating mankind with the attribute of justice. I am treating mankind with the attribute of mercy. And I'm going to tell you something. You have to know that even though it doesn't make sense sometimes what I do, you cannot explain what I'm doing, you still have to understand, Baruch Dayan Emes, my fund, fundamental principle that I represent is the attribute of justice. But when I operate on the attribute of mercy, you cannot understand, and I cannot explain it to you at this point in time. There will come a time that you will understand it. When the Mashiach comes and the 50th gate is revealed, then you will understand what the attribute of mercy is and why it has to be hidden. But you have to trust me, because you have to realize who I am and what I do. You cannot create the universe with billions and billions of galaxies and stars and manage all of it unless you are God. And just like I know everything about everyone and everything, I am in charge of operation of the whole universe. I am in operation of the deeds of mankind. But I tell you, you have to trust me. Because all you can see from me is when I do that, you have to say, that we know God is a God of truth. And I'm always a God of truth. But somehow in the manifestation of the attribute of, of mercy, you cannot know what I'm doing and you have to trust me. That's why it says, uh, Shai says, Tzadik uh, Bermuno uh, but even though at the beginning of time I've given you that wisdom, I have confiscated that wisdom. Because since you have forced me to act through mercy, and I cannot reveal to you how I am acting, you therefore have to have a moon in me that I who designed the entire universe and everything in it, I'm still in charge. And it's, it's always through justice. But to mercy, I have to change it in some way so that I cannot reveal it. So that's what God said. So therefore, Einstein was incorrect. He couldn't understand how God was the God of justice when it came to the laws of physics in the universe. And you can clearly see, Einstein said, that God designed the universe without a question. But you cannot see how God is the God of justice while he's doing mercy. That's a shroud. He covers himself. But Einstein could not admit that. He could not see that. So God, so Einstein said, no, I'm going to judge God. Yeah, maybe when it comes to physics, God is the design of the universe. But when it comes to human nature, God does not design the universe. And mankind is hefka. Mankind to do whatever he wants, go wherever he wants, and be whatever he wants. And God cannot control that, or God doesn't want to control that, or there is no God to that. I don't care what it is. Einstein could not handle that. And that was Einstein's that was mistake. That he may have been a super genius, but he could not in his heart accept the ultimate sovereignty of God. That when God acts in the attribute of mercy, it must be hidden. And yet, God is still dynamic. And Einstein could not tolerate that. And therefore, God understands that mankind also can't tolerate. He understands why mankind is an atheist. Because when you look at the Holocaust, how can you think in an otherwise fashion? When you see what the Nazis did to the Jews and so on, you say, well, where is God? There is no God. But God says to you, how can you say there is no God? When you look at the rest of the universe and you see my flawless, my incredible design. So therefore you have to understand that what? That the reason in my act of mercy that I am doing this for you. To save you. You have forced me to act in this way. And even though now I cannot explain to you why I have to act, you still have to understand that I am the God of regularity. I am the God of design. I am the God of all existence and creation. So that's what God, God says to us, there's a chayk. We have to understand, we have to accept, no matter what happens to us, that we'll command the over the Rahman the top of it. Whatever God does is just, is just. God always knows what he's doing, and everything he does is for our benefit, although we cannot see this. 
But at this point, the attribute of mercy must remain hidden. God never told Moshe Rabbeinu. He never told them Malachim. All of them asked God, where are you? We don't see you in the act of mercy. And God said to them, trust, believe me, I know what I'm doing, number one, and everything that I'm doing is for good. And it's up to your level of Ramun to accept that. And we can accept that. It may be difficult, but we can accept that. Because when you look at God's level of mind in his act of creation, and how meticulous and how formidable his, his strength is, you actually say, I'm only a human being. I can't understand what God has done. But just like I believe in God as the God of creation of existence, the God of physics and so on and so forth, I believe there's a God in terms of constructive purpose. God is doing that for my benefit. And I don't understand how, but I accept his explanation that one day I will understand that. So I can't follow the dictates of Albert Einstein. He failed. He was able to respect God as the God of justice, but he could not respect God as the God of mercy. And he could not accept that edict that the attribute of mercy wouldn't work. You know, it wouldn't work with the knowledge of it. But someday God will reveal this to mankind. So we cannot take Albert Einstein as a model. So we have to take what Moshe Rabbeinu was. Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end of his life, couldn't go into the land of Israel. And Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, I have done so much for the Jewish people. I have gone through the desert. I have saved them from Egypt. I have based my whole life on doing your will. Why can't I go into the land of Israel? So God said to him, because if you go into the land of Israel, I cannot be a God of mercy. I have to be a God of justice. So what did Moshe Rabbeinu say to God? Hatsu Tomin Poloi. God is a God of what? Of perfection. That even though I can't go into Israel yet, and none of that, I won't even be buried in the land. In the land of Israel. Not only that, I will not even be in Gan Eden like all other souls. But in some way, I have to be with the Jews in Golis. That Golis will simply uh, be extant and be around. And I have to share that destiny with them in order to preserve them. But Moshe Rabbeinu himself said, his, rock, his work is perfect. And therefore, all of us are obligated to believe in God. And that has to be our muna. In this time, we have to be different kinds of maminim. You know, we have to be maminim, though, even though we cannot understand what God is doing, but it's going for a purpose, and it's completely righteous. And not like Albert Einstein thought, well, no, God cannot be a God of human history because God is not righteous. Okay. Okay. So thank you.